I'm delighted to see you all here. I appreciate BJ's introduction. Of course, uh, you realize I'm still living with him. So he didn't want to go home with me being disappointed. But I wouldn't be. He gives me a lot of credit sometimes, but I'll tell you, this young man, well, I used to say this young man, uh, but uh, he has far exceeded anything that I taught him, and he has become his own uh, student and uh, diligently uh, searches the scriptures for the things that he does, and uh, I couldn't be prouder of him. People come up to me and say, I'll bet you're proud of him. Well, that goes without saying, yes. Uh, I'm so thankful in going back again to some of what I said uh, Monday night. Uh, the young man that converted me, Joe Crockett, has been responsible for all of our family becoming Christians because of what he taught me and uh, uh, I'm getting on up there in years. I don't know how much more time the Lord will allot me, but I'll say something when I was a lot younger, I, I met an elderly lady, she was in her 90s and uh, I said, well, uh, how are you? And she says, well, I'm ready to go and ready to stay, whatever the Lord wants. And so uh, I've uh, tried to think about that and uh, fixed my mind on that too. But I'm thankful for your presence here. Thankful for the work here at the school and glad to be a, a part of it. Uh, I'm 80 years old now and my uh, body is slowing down. So you may have to tolerate that a little bit throughout this lesson, but I'll do the best I can. The blood of Christ secures our remissions of sin. That is a timeless truth. It will be true no matter what anybody else says. Uh, from now until we're swept, swept into eternity. And there are going to be many, I don't know how many, nor do you, uh, that will regret not having paid attention to that statement and uh, its meaning for them in their lives. Hebrews 9.22 insists, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. The Hebrew writer had been talking about the fact that uh, even in the Old Testament, there were blood sacrifices essential for uh, getting the uh, Hebrews to uh, enjoy a, uh, a time in which they would not be called to account for their sins because of the blood of the animal sacrifices. But ultimately... The Hebrew writer again says in chapter 10 and verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. And so that opens up a, a channel of thought. Well, if it couldn't take away sin, why did uh, God require it? And uh, why do we insist that's necessary today? Because there is a world of difference between 
bulls and goats and uh, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Robert Lowry wrote a book or wrote a song uh, entitled Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And uh, Lowry was correct, and most people who profess to be Christians today would agree with that statement, although uh, not all. There was at least one major denomination, uh, I believe the Methodist Church some years ago, uh, had a movement among them to where they thought their hymn books were filled with too much gore and uh, objectionable statements. And one of the things that they picked on was the blood of Christ. And so they purged the word blood from their entire hymnal. Uh, they thought they were being dignified, you know, and... Uh, but uh, if it's something that the Lord has required, uh, we have no right to turn it down. Also, there's uh, one uh, translation. I haven't searched them all, but I do know that <clears throat> the uh, today's English version, also called Good News for Modern Man, uh, Remove the word blood from a multitude of New Testament verses. I'll give you just a sample of some of that. In Acts 20 and 28 in the King James Version, uh, Luke says, uh, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to Feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. But today's English version says, Keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock which the Holy Spirit has placed in your charge. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he made his own through the death of his uh, own son. Well, you say that it does talk about Jesus' death, yes. But uh, the fact of the matter is, in that passage and several others, uh, in revealing to the gospel speakers and writers what he wanted them to say and record, God used the word blood. Right. And uh, a man can die without shedding blood. Uh, a lot of people have uh, uh, died in their sleep without shedding any blood. Some people have died violently without shedding blood. Uh, in the past, some criminals were hung, but that's, uh, that's too uh, cruel and unjust a punishment. You know, we don't hang people anymore. Uh, there may be one or two states that still does that, but uh, we give them a nice injection and let them go to sleep. Uh, but others, of course, uh, have died from blunt force trauma, being hit in the head, but no blood has been spilled. And uh, even some who have died shedding blood uh, did not, do anything for us in regards to uh, our salvation. When I was a student here in school, I used to preach up in the Boot Hill, Missouri, at a small little community called Bakersville. And uh, on my journey up there one Sunday morning, uh, I was uh, coming off of, or heading on to Crump to head out of the uh, out of town, and there was a motorcycle that had uh, had some kind of accident there. The rider on the motorcycle had hit his head uh, on the ground, and maybe the car had struck him too, I don't know, but there was a pool of blood 
just going down the highway from that. I remember vividly, and the sun was shining and glistening on that blood, and uh, oh, that made an impression on me. And uh, I did not want to drive through that blood, but uh, the police officer that was there said, come on, come on. And so I drove through that, but uh, you know, that was a, that was a tragic thing. Other passages uh, that deal with this, in Romans 3.25, the King James Version says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. But the English ver today's English version says, God offered him so that by his death he should become the means by which men's sins are forgiven, that uh, their, through their faith in him, God offered Christ to show how he puts men right with himself. In the past, God was patient and overlooked men's sins. Romans uh, 5, 9 says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved <clears throat> through the wrath of him. Today's English version says, By his death, <clears throat> we are now but put right with God. How much more then shall we be saved by him through wrath? And on and on we could go. One other one uh, Colossians 1.14, the King James Version says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even <clears throat> the forgiveness of sins. If I didn't quote any of the scripture, that would prove my point assigned to me in this lesson. Uh, it is through the blood of Christ that we have uh, forgiveness of sins. But the today's English Version says, by whom we are set free and our sins forgiven. What I'm trying to say is that it makes a difference whether you put death or blood down there if you're going to listen to what the Bible has to say. Uh, there are so many different ideas about how people are saved today. And many people say, well, we're saved by the blood of Christ. Well, certainly we can agree with that. But uh, there are many of those people who would say something like that who still uh, would disagree with uh, what we believe and will try to show the Bible teaches in regards to uh, how we are saved by the blood of Christ. The need for blood atonement comes from the fact that Man has sinned against a holy and righteous God. And our sins separate us from God. You read Genesis 3. Look at Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2. Where uh, he said that uh, God. Or the prophet said that our sins have separated us from God. And uh, Romans 3.23 said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The idea of atonement refers to the sacrifice made to restore man's relationship with God. It is an offering of God to our sins with the idea of appeasing him and satisfying his demands for justice. We think of sin sometimes as just a little thing. But, uh, the sin that Adam and Eve committed in the Garden of Eden as to eating the forbidden fruit. I mean, what was wrong with that? Well, God told them not to. If we have no respect for God and his authority over us, then we think things are of minor importance. And uh, I've talked with many people, as I'm sure you have, and uh, I've only had one or two people that I can think of in uh, the 50 years or so I've been preaching 
that has said, Preacher, I don't have any sins. I've never sinned. And I said, well, you just committed one of the worst sins <laughs> that you ever could, and that is deceiving yourself into thinking you've never sinned. The Bible says all have sinned. When uh, Abel offered his sacrifice for the sins committed by Adam and Eve and the consequent birth of his sons, uh, Abel and Cain, uh, Abel and Cain both sinned and uh, had to offer sacrifices for it. Uh, Abel offered his sacrifice by faith. Uh, Romans 10, 4 say, tells us that faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing. And hearing by what? The word, the word of God. Indeed. And so I... I didn't emphasize this enough, maybe Monday night, but when Joe Crockett told me I believe I'd start reading my Bible, think of how simple that is to tell somebody. Well, you need to start reading your Bible, or would you please start reading your Bible? Sometimes we can't be in a position where we can be with somebody and teach them, but they can be taught by the Bible, uh, as we are. And uh, surely... As the Ethiopian eunuch said uh, to uh, Philip that uh, he needed somebody to help him understand. And we need to be ready to help others understand, but you will never go wrong by telling people to read their Bibles. In fact, that's the only source of information they can find to uh, know what to do. Well... Uh, blood in the New Testament. Christ is set forth as our Passover lamb who saves us from the plague of spiritual death. John 129 has uh, John saying, uh, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now there are a lot of people that think that when Jesus died on the cross... He took away all the sins of all mankind. That kind of idea of universalism, that is, everybody saved, whether they know they have been or not, or whether they want to be or not, uh, because of what Jesus did. God just took that problem out of our hands, and we don't have to worry about it. And it's kind of like the concept of once saved, always saved, you know? Uh, if you don't have to worry about sin and what it does, then uh, you just go on with your life. Now, the how and when Christ's blood saves us is essential. Uh, sin is a common spiritual disease of all mankind, and the blood of Christ is the remedy. Or the prescription. Uh, we may easily see how the blood of Christ applied to each of us saves us from sin. And any remedy that's given to treat a malady uh, like some physical disease, uh, you have to take the medicine that the physician requires and take it in the manner that the physician prescribes. Is that right? Yeah. I just uh, heard on the news this morning that uh, a nurse a practitioner in uh, one of the major hospitals, I forget now where, but uh, she was attending a patient, and the patient uh, became... Uh, dangerously ill with some kind of uh, malady and the nurse ran to the prescription cart that they had there and uh, she would not ordinarily have had access to this particular kind of medicine but she punched in her code and overrode what uh, the prescription cart said, took that medicine, gave their patient an injection and killed her. It was the wrong medicine. 
It was for an entirely different problem, medical problem. And so uh, she's up for uh, murder, and, uh, a lesser charge than uh, first degree murder. But uh, without the proper medicine and without the proper application, there is no cure. You can take two aspirin and tape them to your forehead. If you're like me, you can tape them about anywhere up there. But uh, that will not relieve you of your headache. And uh, you're thinking that it will, doesn't make it happen. And uh, drinking a bottle of iodine will not keep uh, your leg from getting infected and uh, causing you to uh, lose your leg or lose your life. In the same way, neither will an improper uh, application of Christ's own blood heal us from our sins. If the soldiers at the foot of the cross had taken Christ's blood that was streaming from him and rubbed it on their bodies and that, would they have been saved by it? No. No. Not at all. And uh, so the application of the healing benefits of Christ's blood has a spiritual application administered by God when we obey his word. One has not automatically been forgiven because Jesus shed his blood some 2,000 years ago. And uh, the... Religious people that go about saying that we're saved by the blood of Jesus once and for all when he died on the cross. And you don't have to do anything except believe that. Well, of course, uh, they would throw a great part of the Bible away if, uh, if that were the case. Uh, while Jesus hung on the cross, he uttered a prayer to God saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Did God hear Christ's prayer? Indeed. But he did not forgive everybody just that moment that Jesus died on the cross. It made uh, possible salvation for all mankind, but uh, it was only because people heard the word of Christ through the mouths of the apostles and prophets and uh, learned how to make proper application of Christ's blood to one's soul to have sins removed. And uh, that's the same thing that we need to do today. Think of this. Uh, there are two things that... Uh, and. Uh, I had a chart on this that I couldn't find at home, but I, uh, you can make your own chart if you uh, remember these things. There are two things. What can wash away my sins? What Mr. Lowry said? Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what does the Bible say can wash away our sins? <laughs> Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And uh, so that's the what. What can wash away my sins? The blood of Jesus Christ. The question is, when does that blood wash away our sins? And uh, that's a major uh, question that uh, we need to answer. In... Uh, Matthew 26, 28, Jesus uh, said that uh, the cup that he was uh, giving to his apostles to drink uh, at the Last Supper was emblematic of his blood, which is poured out for many. For what? Remission, Remission of sin. His blood is what? But uh, the question is when? And uh, I challenge you to uh, ask people when they say, well, it's just the blood that Jesus shed. We're, 
There's nothing we can do. If we try to do anything, then we're belittling Christ's sacrifice and we're, we're trying to be God ourselves. I don't agree with that. Uh, I don't want to do anything to belittle Christ's sacrifice, but doing what Christ says to do to apply the benefits of his blood to our sin-stained souls is not belittling his sacrifice. What did Jesus say on one occasion? He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and what? Do not do the things that I say. Do not the things that I say. And uh, that's true. I was preaching one time on Matthew chapter 7 and uh, verses 21 and following where Christ was talking about uh, not everyone that, well, that's another passage. But uh, Jesus said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And uh, I preached uh, on the rest of that chapter and on uh, the way out, uh, this fellow that had just become a member of our congregation up in Indiana, uh, he said, I hate that passage. I said, well, I didn't intend to uh, offend you, but uh, I don't think that I said anything that should offend you. He says, well, I think about all my friends and everything that don't do that. Well, I said, don't blame the passage. You know, uh, talk to your friends. Show them. And it wasn't long he left uh, the congregation and brought to my office a whole box of religious books that he had. He'd been to, through a religious training program at one of our uh, regular colleges and uh, didn't profit much from it, I'm afraid. And uh, I don't know what happened uh, after he left. But look at this. Uh, the blood of Christ is what brings us remission of sin. In uh, Revelation 1.5, Christ, uh, or John says that Christ washed us from our sins by his own blood. But how did that happen? And uh, then again, you have... Uh, the passage in Hebrews uh, 9 and verse uh, 14 where he says, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Well, how is our conscience purged? The truth of the matter is it's all how much time I got left? About uh, 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, you took too long to introduce me. Okay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> He'll tell you I'm long-winded too. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the, uh, the question as to what is pointed out in those verses. Remission of sins comes through the blood of Christ. We are washed from our sins by the blood of Christ and our consciences are cleansed by the blood of Christ. But the question is when? And the Bible answers that. In uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, when the apostle Peter was with the other apostles on that day of Pentecost uh, preaching, the first time the gospel message of Christ had uh, gone out, he is uh, talking there in verse 36 of uh, Acts chapter 2. He says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, 
Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, You don't have to do anything. It's already been done. Now that's what many denominational preachers will tell you. He died on the cross. That's it. But Peter was not a denominational preacher. He said, uh, after they asked the question, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, it's that for remission of sins that we're looking at. And uh, that tells us when remission of sins comes. Oh, there are so many people that hate that. But it's the truth. Uh, we receive our remission of sins when we obey what God said to do about it. And we have the hope and the promise of forgiveness. Jesus said in uh, Mark 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized, what? Shall be saved. And uh, one who does not believe. And is not going to be baptized. Is going to be condemned. And so that's the when. The what is the blood. The when is at the time people obey the gospel. In uh, becoming children of God. I want you to remember that phrase. Children of God. Because uh, this is this makes a difference, a transition, when we get a little later. Now, uh, what about uh, the second passage we looked at, uh, Revelation one five, where we spoke of Jesus washing us from our sins in His own blood. That's the what. But when is the when? When does it do it? When the Apostle Paul, as Saul of Tarsus, met with uh, Ananias, who God sent to teach him the truth, he found Saul there penitent, praying and fasting, and... Uh, he said, uh, why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized. And what? Wash away, Wash away your sins. <laughs> That's the when. And I don't know how you can dodge that. Saul, who became a, the apostle Paul, had believed and showed signs of repentance before Ananias came to him and said, you need to rise up and go and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It's that process that refers to calling on the name of the Lord. He wasn't talking about Saul going to God in prayer. He'd been praying, but uh, he didn't find salvation in that prayer because he was not a child of God. But he was told to uh, demonstrate his faith and repentance by arising and being baptized and having his sins washed away. Now, third, uh, Hebrews 9.14, which uh, we read just a little while ago, talks about our having our consciences clean. And uh, we can ask the question, there also, uh, when does that happen? That's the what. Uh, Christ's blood cleanses us from our sins, but uh, when does that happen? Well, you look over in First Peter chapter 3. And First uh, Peter chapter 3 
He talks about uh, the long suffering of God waiting in the days of Noah, uh, where the ark was preparing, wherein few that his eight souls were saved by water. The like figure, that word figure there is uh, not the best translation. It's uh, literally the antitype. The type was the flood, and they're being saved by water in the flood. The antitype, which is always superior to the type, was this action here that uh, Peter's uh, talking about. Uh, the like figure whereunto baptism does also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if an apostle tells you that you need to rise up and go and be baptized, that uh, that's a part of God's plan of salvation, can you leave with a good conscience without having done that? Tell me how you could. No, a good conscience comes from uh, believing and obeying what God says to do. And so uh, the what is the blood of Christ uh, brings us remission of sins. It washes us from our sins and uh, it cleans our conscience. But when is when we obey the gospel plan of salvation which God set forth as confirmed in these passages of scripture that we've looked at. Now, uh, the healing balm of the blood of the great physician is uh, applied to our sin-sick souls when we obey him in becoming Christians. At uh, Hebrews 5, 9, uh, we become obedient. Matthew 7, 21 through 29, uh, again, we listen and heed what the Word of God says, Luke 6, 46, which we've already talked about. Uh, those are what brings about uh, cleansing by the blood of Jesus Christ. One other thing I want to talk to you in just the last few minutes that we have here, and that is uh, this idea, and we're talking about what one must do to become a Christian. And uh, one of the things that uh, rankles me and I've preached a lot about is this idea of the sinner's prayer. You know, you hear it everywhere. Tens or hundreds of millions of tracts have been published telling people, if you'll just say this one simple prayer, and Franklin Graham has been on there just like his father Billy Graham was for uh, decades, saying that uh, if you will just pray this simple prayer, God, I, I love your son Jesus Christ and I know I'm sinful and I want to be saved. I promise to serve you. Uh, please uh, save me. And uh, Franklin Graham says, if you said that prayer, you can know that you're a Christian. No, that's not true. Uh, what these articles up here on the stand that I want you to take copies of, I, I made 50 copies because I thought we'd have a, a good size audience, but uh, I was supposed to preach here Tuesday according to what many of you may have thought, but I'm glad you're here regardless of that. And so uh, however many is there, if you want to take two or three, that's fine. If you want to give them to somebody else, but uh, I wrote three lessons entitled, You Cannot Become a Christian by Praying to Christ. That's just not the way God set it up. And I don't care. And uh, I hope if you'll read those lessons, you will become more and more aware of the fact that there is no 
no truth in that statement that you can become that you can become a Christian because you cannot become a Christian. But now, as a Christian, we had better be praying to God about uh, our sins. First John chapter one is such a beautiful passage, and I'm going to. Uh, Go through that. Uh, look in uh, 1 John 1, beginning at verse 5. This then is a message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now look, John is writing to Christians. He's not writing to unbelievers in the world, but he's writing to Christians. And he puts himself in the same boat with them and says, if we say we have no sin, if we say we have no sin, we lie and do not the truth. Do Christians sin? Yes, we do. How do we receive forgiveness of those sins? We have to go back and be baptized over and over again every time we sin and repent? No. Uh, this is one of the beauties. And the blood of Christ is involved in this. He said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with uh, one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth isn't in us. Look, if we confess our sins, what? He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that's the way we receive forgiveness of our sins as Christians. But unbelievers, people that are not Christians, cannot do that. They don't have the right to do it. But once you become a part of the body of Christ, and I've, uh, in this lesson, uh, in the uh, lecture book and that, i go ahead and talk about the church uh, there. I was uh, thinking I was going to have time to cover some of that, but I don't. But I've, I've tried to cover a major assignment here, and that is that uh, there is no remission of sins without the blood of Christ. And once you obey the gospel and become a Christian, you can continue to receive forgiveness through the blood of Christ. If we sin, we confess those sins, and God is faithful. Won't ever be a time that he... Think about it. How many times have you sinned in your life since you've become a Christian? We don't know. We don't want to know, do we? <laughs> but God forgives every time if we recognize that and ask his forgiveness through the blood of Christ. And uh, won't it be wonderful to look upon the face of the Savior that died for us and suffered the agony of the cross and shed his blood so that we could live with him eternally. And most of you probably have many, many loved ones that you're longing to see again who have passed from this world uh, to paradise. I do too. And I'm like the old lady I told you. I'm ready to go. But I'll stay if that's what the Lord wants. God bless you all. Thank you for your good attention. I do appreciate very much uh, the message. I would